Welcome today to our webinar series. Uh, this is the fifth of five. Hi, Christy. Hi, and, and we are talking about architecting your CS interview process. My name is Dave Blake. I'm the founder and CEO of Client Success, and I am excited as usual to welcome Christy, uh, who is uh, presenting all of these sessions, sharing her, her passion, her thought leadership, and actually what she does here at Client Success. So welcome, Christy. How are you doing today? Hey, Dave. Great to be here, but kind of sad. This is the last one. I can't believe we've gone five weeks already. <laughs> I know it's crazy, but uh, as we as we said, we'll, we're going to give everybody a surprise at the end. Um, so we'll we'll save that cliffhanger to the end. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for those of you who have joined any of the the other uh, sessions in this series. If you've watched the recordings and are joining this one live, uh, great to have you back. Great for you to join. Grateful. Um, so today, as Dave mentioned, we're going to talk about architecting your CS interview process. I'm going to get into the weeds and talk about really the benefits of having a more thoughtful strategic interview program, especially in today's competitive market and landscape. Um, we're gonna talk about how to go and execute that effectively, the benefits to the candidate, the benefits to your company. So lots of great stuff. As always, we will be sharing this deck as well as a couple of templates that I've created, one of which will include all of the questions that I ask in my interview process. So talk about transparency, um, everything that I ask or folks on my customer, uh, I'm sorry, rather my interview panel that they ask will all be shared as well as like the framework, how we go about scoring the criteria, everything. So really cool to help you and your recruiting teams if you have them to get started. So let's just jump right in. All right, so the first thing I wanna talk about is the impact of hiring people, right? This is, it's so critical. And I'm sure all of you who have been around for a while, if this maybe is your first job, uh, maybe you haven't <laughs> had the impact of a hiring the wrong person, but I will tell you when you get hiring right, there is immense upside to you, your team, your business. And so the first thing I would say is it saves time, right? Having a very well thought out, well-structured program is gonna help drive efficiency in your process. Hopefully ensuring that you're getting the right people into the queue, you're not spending time, tons of time navigating people that aren't gonna be a fit or interviewing the wrong types of people. So having a good process and a good program in place as well as making that right hire is gonna save you and your organization a ton of time. It's also gonna help foster business growth, right? So think about it, you get really strong people, you get the right people for your organization at the stage you're at, in the space that you're in, and you're gonna have someone come in and be able to drive immediate impact. And that person obviously is gonna be contributing to the growth. And so that's gonna be super critical, right? So if you get the right hire, you can anticipate probably more of that sooner. Reduces turnover costs. Um, there is a huge cost that I feel like is sometimes lost on folks on hiring and firing. And I know that there's a lot of companies that are like, you know, fire fast, like bring people on board. If it doesn't work out, give them 30 days and, and turn them out. But it's actually really expensive to do that. And so for organizations that don't have endless funds, uh, maybe a, a bit more uh, conservative with how they're spending their money, you know, getting the right people into the organization, folks that are going to stay for a while, right, is going to help reduce those costs. And so bringing that down is going to have nice impact as well. Positive morale, right? Think about it, you bring the right person with the right energy, the right experience, the right skills into your team, and it's gonna uplift and up-level everybody. And so the morale boost that that has is really tremendous. Um, I can speak to that today, having had my, my team meeting this morning with one of our new hires who just joined, who's on today's webinar, uh, and you know, bringing her on board, it like the whole team just lit up with conversation and excitement. And that is what you would expect when you bring on somebody who's gonna be a good fit. The next thing is think about your brand image. Um, I know that you might not think that there is a huge correlation um, to hiring right people, but it has a brand image, right? An image, I'm sorry, impact on your brand image. If you're an organization that's known for hiring and firing, right, that's out there in the community, especially within customer success, given that there are not millions of us out there, right? It is a small community, people talk. You don't want to be known as an organization who, who does that. Um, also, right, good employee experience, that also will help with either future hiring or, or lack thereof. So you wanna make sure that you understand how your brand is being represented in the community as a result of this. 
And the last thing is maximizing productivity, right? If you get the right person into your organization, they're going to be able to start, they're going to ramp well, they're going to ramp quickly, they're going to be able to start to contribute value really soon. And so that productivity will obviously help. And it's what you expect from bringing on a new hire. So, you know, as you're thinking about, wow, okay, well, you know what, I don't, I don't really have the time or the resources to spend a lot of time on crafting the right hiring plan or, or, you know, uh, strategy for my interview process. I'm telling you, there is huge upside across the organization. It's not just you. It's not just your team. It's the entire company. And if you think about it, if you're a small company, every person has material impact on things like culture and morale and business growth, right? And, and productivity. You don't have the ability to bring in somebody who's not going to be contributing at 110. So you got to think about that, right? So if you haven't spent a lot of time, hopefully today's conversation will give you the tools and a little information that will help get you thinking creatively about how can you optimize your process. So the next thing I want to talk about is the market. Um, I did a quick search on LinkedIn. In fact, last night, just to make sure that I had current data, but I just did a job search here, worldwide customer success jobs, right? Just anything that had customer success. This doesn't include things that have account management or onboarding, right? There's, there's tons of different roles and unique titles there, but just did a search for customer success. 277,618 results came back. That is crazy. This market is on fire. Customer success in industry is lit up. And I'm telling you, there are more openings and there are qualified candidates out there. Um, as a hiring manager, I can tell you there's, there's a lot of great people. It, it varies based on like who you can hire and where you're at as an organization, right? I wish I could hire everybody. Um, but it's, it's crazy to see this, right? And so as a result, the salaries that people are commanding. I mean, it's it's great, right? If you are an applicant in today's market, good for you. Um, you definitely have your pick of the litter. But if you're if you're an organization who is hiring, it's it's competitive, right? And so you don't have the luxury of getting this wrong. This isn't like you've got hundreds of thousands of candidates who are dying to take a role at your company. You've got to make sure that you're thinking about creating a good experience for them, moving quickly. And so this is just important to note there, right? It is a competitive market in customer success. So this is something you need to be thinking about and you need to get right. So the first thing I want to talk about is designing your job description. Um, I will tell you, <laughs> I read a lot of job descriptions out there to see and, and compare to kind of what I put out there as a hiring manager. And something I see pretty often, I'll give you a funny story too. A lot of people like to copy and paste, right? Like, oh, I know this other company that's hiring and you know we want exactly what they're doing, right? So we're just gonna hire their description and we're gonna use that as ours. We'll just change out the company information. Let me tell you that I've caught actually people who've done such a copy paste job that they've actually included the name of the company they've copied it from because it was in the context of the job description. So even if you're gonna steal it, which I do not recommend, please at least go in and review all of the words there to make sure you've cleaned it up a little bit. But um, really what I wanna emphasize here is the importance of getting your job description right. Um, a lot of people used to say, you know what, we wanna post a job description that's gonna cast the widest net. And in some roles, let me tell you, if it's a volume higher role, sure, that makes a ton of sense. But the reality of it is, you know, you'll save a lot of time and do a better service to your team and your resources if you actually are more specific with your job description and more thoughtful about how you're compiling that to bring in qualified, strong fit applicants, right? I don't need hundreds of people that aren't going to be, you know, folks that I might consider, right? I wanna see folks that are qualified for the job I'm hiring for, folks that are gonna be a fit for where we are in our stage. And so, you know, making sure that we've crafted a really good, strong job description will ensure that we're doing that. Now, obviously it assumes that folks are reading the job description, which you like to hope that they are. Um, but if they are, hopefully this is what it will sound like. One, you're gonna lead in with the why they should work with you. Now, let me tell you something. Um, there's a lot of generic, kind of stories that companies will put out there, right? Like about who they are, but it doesn't really include why that candidate should want to work there, right? It's more like the who we are description. You've got to draw folks into your business, draw them into the opportunity, draw them into your culture, right? D write up a description that's going to make it feel so compelling. They need to be a part of your business, right? Your, your company and this opportunity is so unique and so special that nothing else compares or competes with it. Um, I've read, like I said, so many that are just very generic. It's about the company. And I guess, sure, it's okay. But what makes you special? 
why is this going to be that person's dream job? So get creative with the content that you're putting there, right? Work with your, if you've got a recruiting team, work with them. The next thing is your position details. Please put, put details into this, right? You want to provide an overview of the position and what the role is all about, but you want to tell a story of what they can expect to do in their day-to-day. Um, I, again, I see things that are, are very copy-paste and very generic in the job description, but you serve a unique customer. You're in a unique industry, right? What is it about the work that you do with the product that you support, with the folks you work with, with your cross-functional teams? What does that look like and how does it differ from all the other opportunities out there? Again, everything you put in here should be a unique, almost selling point, right? This is how you're selling this job and hopefully bringing in candidates as a result. So please provide those details, but tell a story. Um, the next one is the position competencies. This is, again, experiences, skill sets, traits required. Um, I will say, I think some people get overly specific here, almost to a point where candidates almost self-select themselves out because they feel like they're not qualified. Be thoughtful about what you are actually requiring and don't make everything required, right? There are things that are nice to have. And maybe you're over-indexing on this skill set, right? The skill is more important, those transferable skills. Or, you know, I've even seen folks do really creative things, especially within customer success, where folks are transitioning into this industry, right? They said, you know, great candidates come from, and it's other types of roles and jobs, right? If you are a technology and you've got hospitality, you know, your candidates have hospitality skills. We've seen folks in hospitality and education translate awesomely into customer success, right? Very successfully because of those transferable skills. So if you're willing to hire folks that don't have customer success experience, but have experience in other industries that you know will lend really well to your role, to your organization, to your customers, put those out there. It'll help you also with the keyword search in terms of what people are looking up and what will show up. Um, so, you know, also put that in there. I think, again, you'll, you'll bring in people that maybe don't have the exact experience, but those transferable skills are still very applicable. Um, and the next thing here is your position outcomes. I think folks want to understand the impact they're going to make in a business. And so I always really like to make sure that we're talking about what will they directly be responsible for, but more importantly, what's the impact they're going to make on our company? You know, many of us are coming from SaaS organizations at various stages. And that said, if you're joining an earlier stage company, you have the ability to make a huge impact. Put that in there, right? Talk about how you expect them to really be a part of designing and defining your culture and, and helping, you know, get to these big milestones and innovating and things like that, right? Just make sure that you're, you're selling it, but the impact, because people are really big on that. Candidates, and I speak to so many, are always like when I ask them what's important to them, they want to be in a role where they are going to be able to drive material impact for the business, for their customers. And so, again, do it through storytelling, paint a picture, but get them to visualize themselves in your organization doing their job with the skills they have, driving immense impact. And if you do a good job packaging that up, you're going to draw in the right people. And that's where it all starts. So, if you have not read the job description for roles that you're hiring for on your very own website, I would encourage you to do that. I would encourage you to look at these four elements and make sure that you're checking all those appropriate boxes. And if you're not, go, go to your recruiting team or go to whomever crafted it, or if it's your job and just refresh it, revise it and see if that helps you actually qualify better candidates, get more folks in, draw more interest and excite people about your business. All right, so we all know that there are certain elements of an interview, but I don't want to talk about those just yet. I want to kind of talk about the, the non-negotiables, if you ask me. Um, and this is really, there's four elements to this. It's expectations, timeline, communication, and preparedness. Um, now, I'm sure many of us have been interviewers and have been interviewees. And I'm sure we can all reflect back to some of the best interviews we've ever had and some of the worst. And I think that was the impetus of me creating this slide specifically, because when I think about some of the best interviews and the best experiences I've had, it's with companies and people who have done these four things really well. And when I think back to some of the worst experiences I've had, it's where people failed to do this. So let's talk through these four elements. And then I want you all to think about, you know, do we do these things well today? Can we do a better job with it? Maybe you don't know, and if you're a hiring manager, that's not great either. So let's start from the top. First thing is setting proper expectations with the candidate from the beginning to the end. I will tell you, like, I walk my candidates when I speak with them from day one 
through every step of like, here's what our interview process looks like. Here's what you can expect. Here's who you'll be speaking with. Here's what we are, are digging into. Here's why we're asking the questions we are, the style of our questions. Here's how we're measuring, you know, your ability to do the role based on these responses, right? So we are just super, super clear. Um, and I think that that makes a big difference, um, right? They don't have to guess. They're not sitting around wondering. They're very clear on how they can prepare. What are the types of conversations they're having? Who are the types of people they'll be speaking with in our business? And why we're including those people as part of the interview panel. So if you can, make sure that you're doing a great job setting proper expectations from day one. The second is strong communication. How many of you who have, you know, interviewed for a job and didn't really get what you needed. You didn't understand who you were meeting with. You didn't have any follow-up. Uh, you, you fell out of the process, right? You thought you had a great interview, but then nobody ever reached out ever again. Those are all parts of communication. And an organization's ability to do that really well will make sure that you're never in the dark, right? How just like, oh, especially if you've been on your 800th interview and you're just like trying to find a job, coming out of the pandemic, it was super hard for a lot of folks. And if you're just not hearing back, organizations are just not communicating with you. It stinks, it's really hard. So put yourself in the candidate's experience and think about what are ways that we can enhance communication to just make sure that they know where we're at in our process, where they are in our process. It's just gonna transform everything for them. It, it also reduces their need to follow up with you and chase you on things. So think about it. You know, I, I try to treat my, my interview process um, and my, my candidates as I would my customers. So especially in customer success, this sets a great tone for your candidates on what your customers are receiving. So if you think about it through that lens, we're in customer success, treat your candidates like customers, and it will transform their experience. It'll also help them see how you might approach customer success. So communication is key. The third one here is your timeline. Make sure that you're very clear with them on this, right? And even if you said, you know what, we're starting our process now and it's gonna be 45 days before we decide that we're gonna make a decision, let them know that, right? You don't want people sitting around waiting, thinking, you know, just establish a timeline. Let them know how quickly you're looking to move. Um, you know, just communicate that early and often. If your timeline is changing, again, going back to communication and setting expectations, let them know. So a set a timeline though. Uh, I'm sure for a lot of us, we've got certain hiring requirements or we've got certain needs, right? We've got to bring folks in by a certain timeline. Make sure that you're just establishing that up front. Also establish what their timeline is. It's not one-sided, right? Find out, you know, if we were to move to offer, how soon can you start with us? Um, how much notice do you have to give to your current employer? Are you anticipating taking any time off between jobs? You know, understand their timeline because you've got to get the two to work together. It's not just about you. It's not just about your business. It's also about the candidate. And so making sure you establish the timeline which you're looking to work within and also theirs as well. I will tell you also when I ask this question, I also find out usually fun things like where else they're interviewing and how far along they are in those processes, which will help me understand if I've got somebody strong, how fast I'm willing and able to move to accelerate them in our process, right? Adjusting my timeline to meet theirs. So it is really a great kind of line of questioning conversation that with your candidates will help you kind of remove a lot of roadblocks, but also again, set proper expectations. And the fourth one is preparedness. I don't know if any of you have ever attended a, an interview where it was very clear that the person interviewing you did not read your resume or was not prepared for the discussion. Well, I have, sadly. And it's a huge waste of time for everybody. So what I can recommend is that, or what I am recommending rather, is that you be prepared. Whether you are the person driving the process, whether you are just a person as part of the interview panel, you make sure that you are reviewing that candidate's credentials well in advance. Go look at their LinkedIn profile, read their resume, read their cover letter if they've submitted it. Go back and read the feedback from other people who have interviewed them already. Just make sure that you're coming to that conversation prepared. This will also make sure that you're making the best use of both your time, but also having a better discussion because of it. Um, I will tell you like the way that we've structured ours and I'll walk you through it is such that there is specific questions and things that we're indexing on with every stage in our process. 
And what that also helps to make sure is that we're not asking the same questions over and over because that's also really horrible, right? If you've gone through an interview and somebody asks you five questions and then you go to the next interview and they ask you the same five questions, it's it's a very disconnected experience. It's not great, right? And they're not learning a lot about who you are and the value you'll bring to the business. So whether you are on the interviewer side or the interviewee side, um, you know, preparedness is obviously going to have significant impact. So again, if you change nothing else, just be cognizant of these four elements. And I promise you, even just enhancing the experience around these four will make sure that you're having a more effective, more thorough interview. All right, no need to move backwards, Christy. Let's move forward. I can find forward. Sorry, guys. There we go. All right. So the first stage in my interview process is obviously just, you know, we want to get started. We want to just have a conversation with all of our candidates to assess where they are, where we are, what we're looking for, what they're looking for to establish, is this a mutual fit, right? Does it make sense for us to actually embark in this interview process? And we set proper expectations up front, right? We tell them this is an exploratory conversation. Our goal here is to find out what you're looking for, talk about what we have to offer and see if it's a fit. And that's all it is, right? Think about like online dating. That's really all it is, right? It's that getting to know each other, right? Should we actually go meet up? Um, so let me tell you a little bit about this stage in our process. So one time allocation, we allocate 25 to 30 minutes for this. Now, um, just for clarity, you'll see weird time allocations. And that's because I do meetings that are 25 minutes or 50 minutes to allow myself to have buffer. So if you don't do that, 30 is fine. If you do 25 works, um, and you'll be able to fit in the conversation in that allocated time, trust me. But the next thing we do is we want to make sure that we have a very clear objective. And so with this initial conversation, it's all about establishing mutual fit for the candidate and for the role, right? I know what it is that I'm looking for as a hiring manager. Um, I know, you know, that candidate probably has an idea of a place that they want to work and, and there's other elements to that as well. So you just wanna see, can we be successful together? Now, this can be run either by your recruiter, which is very, very common if you're in a larger organization that you've got recruiting resources. This is kind of like that exploratory discovery call that they will have. Um, I will say if you are the hiring manager, I would just make sure that you're prepping your recruiter on the types of questions to ask and the kind of answers you're looking for. Um, make sure that you're providing coaching and you're leaning in there. So remember, this is your candidate. It's your hire. It's your responsibility. So be accountable for that. Um, don't just assume that, oh, well, it's off with recruiting, so I don't need to worry about that. You very much do. Um, so kind of own that. Just partner with them strategically on it. So what's the discussion I have here? With this one, I make sure we do proper introductions. I allow myself to get to know them, who I am. We talk about the company. We talk about the role that I'm hiring for. And then I spend more time getting to know them, right? I want to hear a bit more about their experience. Um, I don't want them to regurgitate their, re their resume or their LinkedIn profile. That's not valuable to anybody. But just get a sense of their experience. What have they done? What, it, what are they proud of that they want to share with you? Make sure that there's alignment between the work that they've done and the work that they want to do. Um, I do talk about compensation, and I know this is taboo for some folks, but for me, there is nothing worse than getting to the end of a very extensive process to only be extremely misaligned on compensation. So I do ask what people's compensation expectations are. I don't ask them what they're making. I ask them what they'd like to make or what they expect to make in their next role. And I'm also very transparent about what my compensation allocations are for the role. And we talk about that. And I will tell you, I've had a lot of really probably would have been great candidates who I just couldn't afford, right? And I don't want them to take steps backwards if they were earning something, right? They're, they're trying to provide for their families and their lifestyle. Um, but I only have the budget I have. And I'm also very transparent about negotiation with me, right? I do share the range and I tell them, listen, this is what it is. I'm not gonna be able to go back to the well on this. So if this does not fit in line with what you hope to make, um, you know, let's, let's part as friends. I'm happy to add you on LinkedIn and, you know, send any other jobs that I find across the way your way, if it makes sense. But I do think that compensation upfront is important. And please, if you know that your budget does not support a candidate, please do not put them through the process only to disappoint them later. It is really, it's horrible and heartbreaking. Um, so just make sure, again, going back to expectations, be open about that. I also talk about their starting timeline, which I mentioned, and competing opportunities. I do want to know if they're far along in a process, right, where does that leave us? Do I need to accelerate things? Do I need to adjust how we might be approaching the conversations um, from a scheduling standpoint that obviously, you know, there's a lot to consider there. So we do talk through this, right? And maybe they're very early on in their, their, their search, or maybe they're late stage with other companies, or maybe this is the only opportunity they're considering because it's so awesome. So just make sure you get an understanding of what that looks like for them. 
Now, in terms of what I'm assessing, I want to figure out, does this candidate have the right experience and, and or skill set to be successful to do the role I'm hiring for? Does this role align with what they're looking for? I spoke with a, a wonderful, wonderful candidate the other day, and I'll tell you, everything that she wanted to do was just very misaligned with what our job actually is. And I had to be very honest with her. I was like, listen, I don't think that you're going to be happy doing this job. This is very different than the work that you want to be doing. And, you know, I want employees to come on board who are going to be happy and excited and passionate about this role. And if it's really misaligned, like, let's be open and honest about that. What I don't want to do is try to convince a candidate that this is going to be great only for them to come in and feel like they were duped, right? Like, so I don't want to sell something based off of something that's not a reality. So I'm very transparent and honest with that. So this is my getting started. This is where it all begins. Assuming that everyone feels good, we continue into the process. So let me introduce what that looks like. So this is my concept of interviewing with impact. Um, there are five stages, sometimes six, depending on organizations. But what I've designed here is five plus that initial. So this is how it's broken down. Once we go through and assess mutual fit, the first conversation we're going to have is this customer success deep dive. These all of my stages are all run by behavioral style interview questions. So think about it. It's more like, tell me a time when, give me an example of, you know, they're all very, you know, storytelling, open-ended where I'm looking for examples of real world experiences that they have navigated that will help me understand how they think, how solutions oriented they are, their ability to collaborate and more. So stage one is all about customer success. Um, I dig into a whole bunch of different cool scenarios or, or not so cool scenarios that we as customer success professionals face often. And I wanna hear how they've navigated them, right? What they've learned in their experience and allow them to lean in with really neat stories. And I'll tell you, you learn a lot about somebody based on not only what they've done, but even when they share with me like, hey, it didn't go as planned, but here's what I learned. And like, here's what I anticipate I would do differently as a result of that learning. So it's really great to see candidates reflect back that way. Um, but that's my first one. It's all about customer success. The second one assesses culture fit and not probably in the sense that you're thinking, right? I'm not looking for like, oh, great. Are we all going to be the exact same person? Like, do you fit into our culture? I want to know like, does this person have the right drive? Do they have the right mindset, the right skill set? Like, are they going to be able to roll into our organization, up level our, our team, uh, contribute real value to the business, the organization, to my customers? So it's more of a fit into the role in our company at the stage that we're in, not culture in the sense of like, we're all the same. This is great. Uh, I'm not looking for friends, right? This isn't what that is. The, set, the third stage here is customer success in sales. So if your organization works really closely with some of your other cross-functional teams, I think it's really important or it can be really great to pull them into the process. So for us, we work really closely and very hand in hand with sales. And so for us, I want some of my sales team to lean in and be part of this process, right? Get them bought into the candidates that I'm bringing in, but also give them an opportunity to kind of assess and ask some questions that might be geared more, in this case, commercially focused, right? So someone with a strong sales aptitude might have the ability to go a bit deeper and have good questions that will help us understand, does this candidate have that experience, skills or understanding that's gonna help drive our customers forward? That fourth one is with marketing. So very similarly for our business here, you know, we're big on building customer advocates and those advocates will hopefully help contribute to things like speakers that are at our events or webinars. Um, they're going to do case studies with us. They're going to be part of our reference and re referral programs, right? So the ability to facilitate and build advocates out of our customers helps kind of feed that marketing pipeline. And so I want to understand how they have the ability to collaborate with that group. So bringing someone in from marketing also really helps, uh, again, foster that, that collaboration, that buy-in, but then also make sure that we're thinking through the right questions and the right experience to help contribute in that manner. The last stage, and I'm sure this is super, super controversial for a lot of folks, we do do a presentation. I will explain to you what ours looks like. I do not have anyone come and do like a mock EBR or QBR. I don't really like that. But I will tell you, we do do our last session is 50 minutes. It is a 30 minute presentation and 30 minute Q&A. And the 30 minute Q&A is for the candidate to spend 30 minutes asking me questions. Um, I do believe that, right, your, your candidates are interviewing you as much as you're interviewing them. And I don't want anyone coming into my organization 
feeling like they're surprised, right? You have an opportunity to ask questions at every stage of my process. The last one, I give you that much more time. Ask me any question you want, anything we don't get to, happy to answer in a follow-up, but I never want anyone to come in and not know exactly what they're walking in from day one. So going back to that setting expectations, that will help do that. And that I think is the best way to set someone up for success if you're intending to move to offer. So that's what our interview process looks like. I'm gonna go deep here and kind of walk you through all of these. Um, just to, to mention, like these are the things, these are the cross-functional teams that are important for me. I have seen organizations pull in marketing, pull in engineering, pull in IT, right? Like there are different functions you can include in your process. This is mine. This is what makes sense for our business, for our team, for our folks today. Um, so yours doesn't need to look like this. Remember, I tell you all the time in all of our webinars, just because I do it this way doesn't mean that you need to do it this way. It's going to look very different and should feel very different for you, your company, for your candidates. So in this case, mine is sales and marketing. Yours could be sales and product, could be marketing and product, could be product and, and one of your executive leaders. It doesn't matter. Just figure out how do you bring in some of those important cross-functional teams to collaborate with. So let's talk through the first one here. Yes, I gave my, it depends. Uh, yes, that is my, my notorious uh, answer to everything. It depends. So let's break down. So stage one, let me break this down for you. So 50 minutes is what I allocate to this one. This is a deep dive. So I do spend a little bit more time here. I manage this one. So this is, this is something that I run. Again, if you're the hiring manager, it's great for you. If you've got a manager you can delegate it to or someone else on your team, uh, definitely pull them in where it makes sense. Your interviewer will depend on your company. So don't worry about who I have, but for me, it's me, I'm the hiring manager, I do the deep dive. Um, the objective here is to understand my candidate's ability to effectively manage customer situations. Like I said, I go and I ask questions on a whole bunch of things, everything from like M&A to executive turnover to you know onboarding to collaboration, handholding during onboarding. So I have a lot of little great scenarios that I've teed up that again, help me understand their experience or I tell candidates who don't have that specific experience, what would you do? If this was your situation, tell me what you would do. And at least it'll get me an idea of, of how they think about it, right? How they might do that in the future. The discussion, like I mentioned, they're all behavioral style interview questions. In this one, we focus on navigating customer situations. And I will tell you, I always leave time for Q&A. Um, big on watching the clock, right? Time management is part of a customer success skill set. I want to make sure that I'm demonstrating that and leading out in these conversations. So we do watch the clock. I try to allocate at least 10 minutes for my candidates to ask some questions. Now, I will say... <laughs> When I assess them, I also am assessing the types of questions. Uh, I assess whether they ask no questions. I've had candidates shockingly come to conversations with me at a certain level, and I'll ask them, you know, what questions do you have? And it's crickets. They haven't prepared any. They just tell me they don't have any. Uh, and that's shocking, right? Because we should all have questions, right? It, it demonstrates that intellectual curiosity, which is also an important skill set for customer success. But it also helps me show that it helps me see that they're taking this role serious. Um, so candidates, you want to hopefully see that they're asking questions, make time for it, and also make note of the questions that they're asking. So what am I assessing in this stage? So I'm looking at, does this candidate know how to run best practices? Um, how do they handle objections? Are they solutions oriented? Do they have the right technical aptitude? You know, again, depending on how technical your product is, you might want to over index on technical type questions. Uh, if it's not very technical or you have solutions engineers or TAMs or other supporting technical roles, maybe it's less important, right? So you've got to think about the right questions for your team. Um, for me, you know, we've got some technical hats we have to wear. So I want to make sure that I'm not going to scare them away with some of the technical work we'll have to do. So I do want to make sure I'm double clicking into the technical aptitude. Strong communication and time management skills. Um, I have had candidates come on and just be very long winded with their responses, makes it very challenging to get through the other questions I have. So you want somebody who also can communicate succinctly. This allows me to help understand their ability to do that. So Stage one, that's customer success deep dive, really works well to help me understand, can they come and do the job from day one? So two, culture fit. This one is shorter. So I allocate 25 to 30 minutes to this. The candidate will be able to, like I wanna assess, can they effectively ramp into our organization, right? Are they gonna be able to come in, do the job that's expected, you know, onboard themselves, hold themselves accountable, learn the product, learn our processes, be able to, you know, collaborate with teams. Do they ask good questions, right? So I'm, I'm really kind of understanding their ability to come into the business and drive impact. 
So interviewers, uh, for me, I actually have one of the folks on our customer success team do the interview for this one. I think it's great to start to introduce other members of the team who would be their peers effectively. And also, you know, they're great to help me see like, you know, they're the ones who've had to onboard themselves into the business effectively. Do they think that this person can also do it well? So maybe you want to have somebody who's done it really well. So that way they can assess, could this person also do it well? The discussion, like I said, behavioral style interview questions, we focus on onboarding, ownership, collaboration, and then of course, leaving time for that Q&A. Um, this person's also gonna look for things like, did they ask great questions? Were they thoughtful in the questions they asked? Did they tailor their questions to the right audience? Um, right? Don't go asking, if you know you're meeting with a member of the team, don't go asking about like their leadership style as it might not be relevant. So also being thoughtful with the, who you're asking the questions to. For the assessment here, I'm double clicking into, does the candidate have the right drive and initiative to be successful in my organization? Will they work collaboratively with cross-functional teams? Do they have experience with project program management? Um, effectively, whether you're running projects internally or with customers, this is gonna be something that's gonna be transferable either way, an important part of the work that we're doing. So the third one is customer success and sales. Again, allocation, 25, 30 minutes. I'm double clicking into, you know, will this candidate be able to manage the commercial aspects of the partnership? This may not be relevant, right? If you've got a renewals team or a sales team, maybe you don't include sales as part of your process. But for us, we own all of the commercial activities post initial sale. So the renewal, cross sell, upsell, expansion, that all falls under our remit. And so I wanna make sure that my team knows how to run that effectively. Um, so I do invite a member of the sales organization um, and they are the ones driving this conversation. I tend to like to either get somebody at a manager or director or VP level, depending on the candidate, but somebody who's in a leadership role to be a part of that, not just an AE, but again, every organization is different. Here, again, we're, we're focused on those behavioral style questions, but now I'm focused on renewal management, negotiation, opportunity identification, lead generation, and then of course that Q&A. So I asked that this person on the panel assess the following. Do they have the experience managing these commercial motions, right? Do they have strong negotiation skills, ability to manage objection handling? Do they know how to conduct good discovery? So those are some of the things that I know are gonna be important for us to figure out if this candidate can do this aspect of the job, which quite frankly is an important one for us. So if they can do that well is really key for us to double clicking too. So for customer success in marketing, again, 25 to 30 minutes, uh, candidates gonna be able, we wanna measure, can the candidate be able to facilitate marketing initiatives through par customer partnership, right? So CSMs, we've gotta be really strong partners with our customers. It's a lot of relationship development, but also you know helping them get to that point of success. And really good folks on your customer success team that can do that will help power your marketing efforts, which ultimately become your sales pipeline. So really critical role to the business. Um, again, for this one, I like to include somebody from the marketing organization or customer marketing. It can be, you know, I've owned customer marketing in customer success. So I've included my customer marketing manager to run this discussion in other companies um, where I don't own that. And we've got marketing just kind of, you know, everything rolls up under a marketing leader. I might ask some Somebody just from the marketing organization could be somebody from your field, your marketing, your field marketing team. So somebody who's managing events, if that's something that's a big part of your business. So you really have to think about, uh, you know, is it demand gen? Is it field? Is it, you know, content marketing? If you've got all these specialty roles within marketing, what is the, the one that might partner or collaborate the closest with customer success to drive the greatest impact and maybe introduce that person into the panel? So discussion here, again, behavioral style interview questions. Uh, we focus on reference programs, case studies, field events, customer advocacy initiatives, and Q&A. Um, I want to know, does this person have the ability to build brand advocates? Do they know how to maximize the value from customer champions? Are they comfortable asking, customer, asking for customer participation and feedback? Um, not that these are difficult questions or, or conversations to have, but I've worked with folks who just don't feel comfortable asking their customer to do these things. And like, this is a big part of our role. So uh, I'd love to spend time here because again, this is just so critical to the success of the business, right? Your, your customers, happy customers, good, successful customers, they're the ones out there who are going to be selling your business to their peers. They're going to be going to other organizations and bringing you along for the ride, right? That second order revenue. So you want to make sure that you have the ability to you know, really leverage those advocates effectively. 
And then the fifth stage is my presentation and Q&A. So this one I do allocate 50 minutes for, sometimes it does run to 60, so I block the last 10. Um, and really the objective here is, can the candidate strategically manage a book of business to support retention, growth, and advocacy? Um, interviewer here, I do run this one, as well as one other member of my organization. So we do tag team it together. It helps to create a better dynamic. I also wanna make sure that I'm gut checking myself and I'm hearing and looking for all the right things. Uh, having somebody as that kind of second set of eyes and ears is really great also makes for a fun discussion. Um, and then we do ask the candidate to present the assignment and we do allocate, like I said, 30 minutes to, to Q&A. So it's quite a substantial amount of time to just really discuss the opportunity, the company, the role, the customers, whatever it is that they need to. So what am I assessing here? Does the candidate understand how to manage risk and capitalize on opportunity? Do they have the ability to strategically support the future of the partnership? Do they have strong presentation skills, good call control? Do they ask good and thoughtful questions? So this is actually a really great exercise. And I, you know, I do ask every single person who goes through this process, maybe they're going to tell me what they think I want to hear, but I do ask them, you know, how do you feel about the exercise? Is it something that you enjoyed? Did you find it challenging? Was it irrelevant? And I've only really received very positive feedback. And even from candidates, we did not move forward with. They said that they enjoyed it. It was, you know, refreshing. It was something different than they've done before. And it helped them get a sense of like how we are viewing our customers in the business. And I'm, I'm happy to share the assignment with you guys as part of the templates as a follow-up so you can see what our exercise looks like. Um, it is pretty straightforward, but it really does help us understand, you know, a CSM stepping into the role, you're going to get a book of business. And if your goal is to drive retention, growth, and advocacy, I want to understand how you prioritize, how you think about that, how you're managing that risk. And this assignment in 10 slides or less will help me uncover a bit of that, that thought process. So um, I have found this to be extremely impactful. I've also had candidates who have made it to this stage and bombed the presentation, which, you know, we take it for what it is. If some people just don't put any time or effort or energy into it, it's very telling about maybe their enthusiasm for the role. Other people just didn't get the assignment, maybe didn't ask questions. So regardless, right, I don't automatically discount somebody who maybe got nervous and, and didn't do a great job, but I learn a lot about them through this. So for me, it's something I'll continue to do. It's not something that everyone has to do, but like I said, for, for me, understanding the candidate and being able to navigate this with them, I've learned a ton and I think it's super valuable. So let me share some do's and don'ts with you. Um, so start with some do's. Uh, I think it's really important to spend time reviewing applicants' resumes and sharing feedback with your recruiting team. Um, don't let your recruiting team determine what candidates enter into your process. Uh, I've always worked very closely when I've had recruiting teams to say, here are some great resumes. Here are the things that, that I looked for. Here's why I thought this candidate was strong. Maybe as I looked through their LinkedIn profiles, here's what I saw. These are things really stood out to me. Um, I think it's important to help with that as opposed to just assuming that the folks that you're working with will know exactly what you're looking for. People are not mind readers, I've learned. So really, I love to spend time with them. So if somebody is helping manage this process with me, I want to make sure that they know exactly what it is that we're looking for and, and how to find those really stellar standout candidates. The next, next do is get various stakeholders involved in the interview process to support that cross-functional buy-in. Customer success will ultimately work with every single team in the organization, right? It's inevitable. We are kind of, if your customer, if your company is doing it right, we're, we're the center of that. And so it's really important that you get that buy-in from teams that you work very closely with. I've seen organizations really just kind of hire in a silo and, and that's not great. Um, it's not a good candidate experience as they're interviewing and having conversations. Um, they might wonder why they're not getting exposure to other people or other teams. So I think it just, it creates a better experience but also internal buy-in and collaboration. Reply to thank you emails. I know this seems so silly, but um, I will tell you not every candidate sends thank you follow-up emails, but when they do, I absolutely reply. Absolutely. Because if somebody is taking the time to thank me, why should I not be acknowledging that and thanking them as well? Right. Again, they're interviewing you as much as you're interviewing them. Think about your customers. Do you not do you ignore their emails? Do you not reply to them? Be gracious. Right. People are allocating time. They're preparing. Um, it's important. So if you do get a thank you, take two minutes of your busy day and please reply back to them. It doesn't need to be a long, lengthy email summarizing your discussion, but it acknowledges the fact that you appreciate their time and you're happy that they are continuing to be a candidate in your process. Or if they're not, because you've decided to not move forward, you know, definitely close the loop with them there as well. 
set proper expectations with your candidates at every stage around decision-making timelines. You know, as I advance candidates, I let them know when they can expect to hear back from me on a decision, whether we're going to continue or not. Um, right. If I say, Hey, I have to interview 10 more people. And, and those people we're meeting over the next two weeks. So it'll be two weeks before we, we let you know, at least I've set a timeline with them. They're not wondering, they're not sitting around, they're not blowing off other offers because they felt it went really well. Um, you know, it's just, again, goes back to setting expectations, but make sure that the timeline as as you guys are managing it, as it's changing, you let them know. Give feedback to candidates that you're not advancing. Um, this is something that I try to do. I know that I don't have the ability to do it all the time, but for folks that make it pretty far in our process, I wanna make the time, I wanna take the time to let them know why I might not be advancing them, right? Maybe there were certain gaps, maybe there's a stronger candidate, maybe there was something that they didn't do a great job illustrating to me in the conversations that we had. Giving feedback, helps strengthen them as candidates and makes them better. Um, as long as you're delivering it in, in a good, positive way, which if you are a CS leader, hopefully that is a skill you have mastered, but give that feedback to them. I have had, I've spent some time, I've had a candidate who asked to get on a call to talk them through how they could have been better in the process. And I've kind of coached them through the feedback that they gave. And they were like forever appreciative when they got their next job. They like sent me a thank you note telling me that they got it because of the coaching I provided. So just think about it's about giving back. Um, not everyone's going to be a fit for you, for your business, but if you can provide some feedback as to why they weren't, it's really helpful. So what should you not do? Um, have the recruiting team divine, define your interview process for your candidates. Um, recruiting is helpful, but this is your hire. It's your process. It's the experience that you want to design. So don't let them do it in a silo. Lean in. You're the hiring manager. This is yours. This is your responsibility. You have to be accountable for this. Don't let it happen behind your back. Hop on a, don't hop on a call with candidates without reviewing their resume and LinkedIn profile. Please come prepared to have an engaging conversation. Um, you know, make sure that you know who they are, what they've done. It'll help you ask more thoughtful questions. It'll help you lean in, create rapport, right? We're big rapport builders in customer success. You want to make a candidate feel at ease in the conversations that you're having. So just be prepared, know who they are, know where they're from, where they live, um, get a sense of maybe what schools they went to, things like that, where they've worked. Maybe you have mutual connections or, or you know, folks that you guys have worked with in the past. So it really just helps foster a better dialogue and again, an experience. Don't ask the same questions at every stage in the process. I mentioned this earlier. I pre-write every question for every stage in our process. And it's not because I'm a control freak, even though I am, it is because I wanna make sure that we're not asking the same questions. I don't wanna have the same conversation over and over. They don't wanna have the same conversation over and over. Um, it's not a good use of time. It's not a great experience. So make sure that you're, even if you're not going to pre-write the questions, that you be sure that the folks that are on your panel know what's already been asked and to avoid those questions. Don't forget to review notes from the previous interviewers. Um, I have found that folks, not only do they ask the same questions, but it's very clear that things that we've talked about or things that I brought up were not shared um, or the person who was interviewing me did not go and reference that or read about them. I think that's important. So just again, if somebody else has been a part of this panel, um, get their feedback beforehand. Um, if they're using an applicant tracking system like Greenhouse or something else, or Comeet, um, it's very easy to go back into those tools and see the feedback, how they responded or answered other questions. So just hopefully everyone's taking good notes along the way. Go and take a few seconds to review those. If they decided to advance that candidate to the next stage, find out why, right? What excited them about this person? Um, and then double click into that a bit. Uh, give candidates, don't give candidates false hope and lead them to believe that they're a lead candidate if they are not. Um, we all want to be very positive, right? And we all want to say, oh, this is a great conversation. Um, it's very exciting. It can be very invigorating. Maybe you're caught up in a moment, but if they're not the lead candidate, don't give false hope. So if somebody did not perform well, if they're not the right fit for you, let them know, or at least don't misset those expectations. So that is a big do not do. So if you're working on enhancing your experience, take some of these do's and don'ts, bring them back to your team, share them with your recruiting organization, and, and hopefully you'll be able to create a better experience for your customers. All right, um, I'm going to share five things. I've been on my five tips kick. So this is the last slide here. Interview tips. One, make sure that you align with the interview panel on roles and assessment criteria. Make sure that everyone knows the role they're playing if you're bringing them into, the, into your interview panel. Um, two, pre-write all of your interview questions. Share them with the panel. It's not saying that you have to use these, but at least help everyone have a few questions teed up to help facilitate the conversation and get to the information you're looking for. 
block time on your calendar. Uh, if you are actively recruiting right now and if you've got a few open roles, scheduling is the most difficult thing. What I used to do always is block off like every, every other day, I would have like a two hour window that was exclusively held for recruiting and interviewing. This made sure that I always had time to meet with candidates, especially if we were trying to accelerate them, especially if you are somebody high in the organization who is not only meeting with your team, your hiring uh, candidates, but also other cross-functional teams, block time, just leave it for recruiting. Four, set a two hour window to receive feedback. You wanna make sure that you're getting feedback and you're moving quickly on it, set that time. So tell everyone on your panel, hey, you have a two hour window to tell me what you thought about that candidate. Now, maybe it's not two, maybe you wanna be gracious and give four, whatever the case may be, set time and say, we need the feedback by this time so we can follow up and either close the loop or advance them in the process. Five, don't sit on strong candidates, it's a hot market. If you interviewed somebody and you love them and then you know they'd be a great fit, do not sit them in the process to die. They will find another job, they will get a better offer and they will go take it. So if there's somebody that you love, try to move quickly, try not to be so rigid about your process and get them into your organization. Whew. Now, I know that we are getting close to that, that window of time, but I wanted to just share with you guys, just when you think it's over, I know that it is week five of this five part series, um, but I do have some surprises that I said I would share. First is, of course, my computer is in sleepy mode because I talk faster than my computer can go. Oh, oh. Okay, so September's lineup. Um, we are coming back next Tuesday to do a live Q&A with me and Dave. We are not presenting anything, but if you attended these five series and you have questions, you're trying to roll this out in your organization, you want to talk about it live with Dave and I, we're going to open this up to the community. Just come, bring your questions. We'll bring answers, uh, and we're going to have a great engaging conversation with everybody. So this is our way of closing out this series with a one hour live Q and A, everything covering those five topics from this, this boot camp. Following that on September 14th, we've got Bob London, who's gonna be joining us on how to have more strategic conversations. So please, if you don't know Bob, go follow him on LinkedIn. He is amazing. This content is a, like, cannot miss. If you are somebody who struggles with this and wants to know how to have better, more engaging conversations with your customers, this is a session for you. Um, I can't reveal the September 21st one just yet. Uh, we are locking this person in, but I promise you it will be fantastic. And 928, I've got my dear friend Charles over at Kenneth Security, who is acquired by Cisco, who's going to talk about how he's managed his customer success organization through an acquisition. Now, one thing I've heard from all of you, I'm so sad this boot camp is ending. This has been the best content that we've had, that we've consumed. Well, because of that, we're coming back for more. So we will be rolling out our October fall edition of our customer success leadership bootcamp. So that is four more weeks of me, four more hot topics. So we're going to come back. We're going to talk about how to execute your, your customer objectives review meeting, that core meeting that I've, that I've converted the EBR to. Um, we're going to do executing count transitions that excite your customers and reduce risk customer offboarding and exit interviews, how to end on a high note, and designing your voice of customer program to power your future. So four hot topics, same format, right? What do you do? Why are we doing this? How did I do it? And tons of templates, right? More decks, more material just for you guys to help you continue to accelerate your customer success programs. So with three minutes remaining, I'm going to stop talking. That was super fast. Uh, I'm going to turn it back to Dave to come on and see if we can answer any questions. <laughs> Should we answer questions or do you want to just drop the mic right there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because, because the, the chat is blowing up. Everybody's so excited. I know. <laughs> uh, more webinars, more Christy, more, more boot camps. Um, thank you, everybody, for your support. Um, do you want to answer one question? Yeah, let's do at least one. Here? We're crazy not to. Here's, a, here's one. I, this might be put, put you on the spot. What's the best oh. question you've ever been asked as a candidate or asked by oh, a candidate? By a candidate. Oh. I can. Any, can you think of one? I really like the ones where people ask me about our customers. So I'm going to give you like the, tell me three reasons your customers churn. Tell me three reasons your customers stay. Um, I love, like if you're coming in to interview for a customer success role and you're not asking about the customers, I think you're missing a huge opportunity. So I won't say that that's the absolute best and greatest, but like those are insightful and those always help me understand that like they get it, right? They get the work they're doing and, and they're being thoughtful about why our customers are doing what they're doing. That's great. Somebody here, Jackie says, uh, Christy, Mr. Culling as an auctioneer. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too late. I have a, the whole back half of my life. Exactly. 
Exactly. Well, let's, with that, I, I want to just stress, I love the uh, thank you note. I love candidates who send a thank you note. I think that's a lost art, but I also love the reminder for us as, as leaders and hiring managers to reply. Uh, being thankful and thoughtful is, is just a, 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 uh, a great attribute Courtesy, for right? anybody. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, it uh, looks like we're out of time. Thanks to everybody who joined us. We're, we're, we're grateful for the enthusiasm. We love this community. We'll continue to do everything we can well, to help. One more thing okay. I forgot, of course. Hey. Sorry, at two minute buzzer, right? Um, we're going to be sending out a survey. Um, I love that you all have been sending me tons of feedback, whether it's through email, in the chat. I love reading these. I've gotten a ton of messages on LinkedIn. It's awesome. I love it. But we want to hear from you. So we, we put together a survey that is exclusively on this boot camp series. I want to hear what you loved, what you hated, what's working for you, what's not. Um, and obviously, as we start to design the future boot camps, which next one is October, um, we want to just make sure that it's the material that you want in a format that you want. If you need me to talk slower, I will hear your feedback. I don't know that I can deliver that. But uh, we want to hear from you. So please take a few minutes. Uh, I get, I've given you a lot. Give me a lot. Take some time. Fill out that survey for us um, so we can make these continued valuable sessions for everybody. So thank you, guys. Hey, thank you. So next next Tuesday, a week from today, we'll be back. Christy and I will just have an open Q&A. Live so Q&A. Please, please come. Bring whatever questions you want. We'll do our best to go through as many as possible. And then Bob London and, and more webinars coming throughout the month of September and another boot camp series in October. Uh, tell your friends. Not the same link. I see that. No, no, there will be a new link. We're going to email exactly. you the link to a survey. We're going to email you the link to the live Q&A as well as the September webinars as well. Yep. You'll get a new one. So thanks to everybody for joining. Uh, and if we can ever do anything, reach out to us anytime at clientsuccess.com. Our email address is on LinkedIn. Wherever we are, we're happy to engage. So thanks again, Christy. Thanks to everybody and have a great week and a great uh, for those uh, in the U.S., a great Labor Day weekend. Thanks, Dave. Take care, everyone. See you, everyone.